Yes, my name is Morten. I work at the, I'm a postdoc working at the Center for Geogenetics, uh, which belongs to the Natural History Museum of Copenhagen. And uh, our place, we, we specialize in, in working with the ancient DNA, with fossil DNA from the ancient. And then uh, today, I'll be trying to give a bit of an overview of the way to do at our place, uh, in particular because of, I really believe that ancient DNA is a booming field these years, and it's really we are realizing when, when talking to archaeologists and anthropologists that there's a, there's a huge potential for doing a, a, a lot of good collaboration. Uh, so today I'll be trying to give you guys a, a brief introduction to, to ancient DNA and what does it imply to actually work with ancient DNA, what kind of questions can we address uh, when dealing with ancient DNA. Uh, then I'll give some examples of some of the ancient human research that have been carried out and at my workplace at, at DNA. And lastly, I'll give a, an, an overview of the project that I'm currently employed on, which is uh, as the presentation's uh, big uh, device on this project. census DNA sequence up in the top, uh, how, how, how it's supposed to look, this is how we know the sequence to look, and then we have uh, eight or ten, how many there is the clones. These sequences are supposed to be identical. All the dots suggest that it's an identical base across all, all uh, eight or ten sequences, but occasionally you will see sequence that where you suddenly have a T, for example, instead of a C or a T instead of a G, or whatever. and these, these, if you don't, Let's say you only pick up the damage sequence when you want to analyze it. You will actually as, sit around and analyze the wrong sequence. And this will look like you will have this called a false genetic diversity in the population of everything you, 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 are, you are actually exploring. So it look like there are three or four different individuals here, but it's, it's all the same. This could be extremely difficult to, to, um, to work out when, you, when you're dealing with these things. We have tools to, to do it statistically and to assess these things, uh, but it can be a major challenge. Um, so why do we even bother with, with all these challenges? Uh, first of all, I mean, I've been working on a lot of extinct species, for example, and that can be a lot of, uh, when you deal with ancient DNA, you, 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 sample the, the, you sample the phylogenetic tree directly, so you go back in time, it's a direct window into the past, you don't have to simulate, you don't have to use computer simulations to actually try and work out how did the ancient DNA sequences look. You can directly, directly go back in time and actually sample the DNA there and then have a direct comparison to how does this species look today compared to how did they look in the past. Uh, for example, this is an example of a mammoth. Of course, it can be very difficult to, to work out exactly what, what, how does the mammoth, how does the mammoth related to other elephants. <coughs> By sampling the, uh, 
So mammoth bone and extracting DNA from the mammoth bone, you could here generate a phylogenetic tree. The authors in this paper and show that the mammoth was closely related to the Indian elephant compared to the compared to the African elephant. Um, and this information will probably not have been available if you didn't have have access to the DNA. Um, then we have reconstruction to past ecosystems. And our place work a lot with trying to extract DNA from sediments, for example, or from ice cores, and all these. Um, uh, organisms that would have lived in the past environment would have left their DNA traces in, in the actual sediments, and, and, and by that way we can work out which species composition, for example, were, were present in these past ecosystems. <coughs> and then, of course, which is probably most relevant to what we've been, dis we've been discussing here in the past few days, is uh, insights into past population histories, migration patterns, and the uh, extinction events. Um, So I thought I'll give you guys a, 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 a big, a, a brief history of, uh, of, of, of the, f to the field of ancient DNA. And uh, I saw several into, into three different parts. The first one I called it the rise. And it all started back in 1984 when Gucci et al. published this paper on, the, on this zebra like animal called the quaka. It's extinct now, it went extinct back somewhere back in the mid 19th century or something like that. Um, that was the first time people really got the idea, okay, let's try, you know we can extract DNA from heaps of different uh, different um, uh, substrates, let's go back and actually try to take an old ancient substrate and see if we can still, if there's still uh, nucleic acids, if there's still DNA molecules present. What these guys show, perhaps not very surprising, is that, again, this is a phylogenetic tree, is that the quagga DNA looks very much like a zebra. I mean, it's, when you look at it, it's probably not a, not a big surprise, but at least it was sort of, it gave some sort of authentication to the results. It was probably the, the, the real thing that we're looking at. Then this guy, Swan de Pablo, who's really, you say, the godfather of, uh, of ancient DNA research. He, he began extracting DNA from some Egyptian mummies back in the early or mid 1980s. I've had good success for that. Uh, I've, many, many years later, I, I've seen an interview with him actually. A few years ago, I can't, I can't remember the exact place, but where, where he where he explained that all the DNA he probably got from these Egyptian mummies were probably his own. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it's a little bit amusing that my entire field of research was established by a Swedish guy who sequenced himself as a <laughs> million. But, but anyway, he had great success after that. He had to find out many ways to actually authenticate his results, and he's a he's a now running a very successful lab down in down in Leipzig. Uh, the downfall, because of course, a lot of researchers realized there were a lot of good stories to be told. Here. So people began to try and get DNA from a lot of different substrates. Here's from uh, some chloroplast DNA from uh, many, many million year old magnolia species. Um, of all published in a very you know, high prestige journals like Nature and Science. Here's a DNA sequence from a fossil termite, amber. It's a whole Jurassic Park scenario. You can actually take some in insects from, from a piece of amber, extract DNA. This one, even older, an old beetle, 120 million years old. Um, and perhaps the most famous study, dinosaur DNA. And this is what led to Michael Crichton writing this his, uh, Jurassic Park novel. And Steven Spielberg making the film. And of course, this is a these studies became super famous and everybody was very, very interested and got a lot of attention. But for example, this particular study, it also received a lot of criticism back then. And this is one of the one of the, the criticisms, for example, the the, 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 the one of the one of the images that almost says more than a thousand words, right? Because these, these guys showed just by doing some very basic phylogenetic analysis that this uh, Cretaceous bone uh, looked very much like human. And of course, um, this was the case of all these studies. A lot of them have never been officially retracted, but everybody knows nowadays that DNA does not survive that long. All this is due to contamination, which, which no one really had a proper grasp on in these times. So, that's your dinosaur. <laughs> so the, then, <coughs> but there's also, it's threatened for a while to kill the entire field of ancient DNA, I have to say, but, but, but some papers were published afterwards that really established a lot of the criteria we're working with today. Uh, and this is the whole thing, we have to work in a clean lab, we have, we have really important results, we, we, we need to send it to a different lab to actually replicate the results, make sure that it's not just an artifact or an artifact of our lab contaminating the, the sample. But there are a couple of these studies coming out that, that establish a lot of the criteria that we are uh, 
applied to it. So how long does DNA survive? This is a study we published very, very recently. Uh, just try to look into the how long, uh, what, what is the record and how long can you expect DNA to find, uh, to find DNA in your samples. And this is just what we did. This was based on a lot of bones from a big extinct birds from New Zealand. And what we show in this paper is that you can actually look at DNA degradation as in terms of half-lives. DNA degrades at a certain rate, uh, a little bit comparable to ice, uh, radioactive isotopes, for example. Uh, as you can see, and we then did some, after establishing the rate at various temperatures, we then did some calculations here. Uh, I have to say these are, of course, really rough <coughs> estimates because there's a lot of environmental variability that, that can influence on these estimates. But one of the interesting things here, of course, that this, this is the half-life of 30 base pair long fragment. This is the half-life of a 100 base pair long fragment. And of course, the longer the fragment is, the shorter is the half-life because of the bonds that are breaking uh, have an equal probability of breaking all of them. So it's sort of a, actually a, we call a Poisson distribution here. That, that, that the longer the, the fragments are, the less probability there are for them to be present. Um, perhaps look at the last column. We see this is this is the average time until every single bond in the DNA backbone is, is broken down. So we only have single nucleotides left. And even at very, very favorable preservation condition at, at minus five degrees, every single bond in the DNA backbone will be will be gone after roughly seven million years. And I have to say this is a very optimistic estimate. So the chance you actually get very long stretches of DNA out of dinosaur bones that are 70, 80 million years old is of course uh, completely impossible. Um, the current record we have is a roughly 500, a half a million year old, and that's been retrieved from, from DNA in ice cores. Quick words on the samples. We work a lot of fossils from different caves, swamps, permafrost environments, sediments, and ice cores, for example. This is an excavation from New Zealand, where we sample down through the various layers. A lot of, of museum collections. Hair, teeth, eggshell, skin, feather, human bones, whatever we can really uh, where they've been living cells in. Uh, workflow, first of all, you get the samples. <coughs> That's the fun part, normally. <laughs> then you do the DNA extractions, where you digest your DNA with various <coughs> enzymes uh, and, and, make, and actually end up having the, the content of the cell out in, in, in solution. Um, then you traditionally do what we call the PCR, the polymerase uh, chain reaction, where you identify which gene you want to look at. This is the traditional way of doing it, where you, where you, have, you have you have your entire genome, but you can never really analyze your entire genome. Having said that, we're, we're, the whole field is transforming into genomics these, these days. So, but, but back in the days of this, you will define which region you will look at by what we call primers. They will bind at a particular place in the DNA, and then you will amplify the, re the region <coughs> between the two primers in, in, in several heat, heat steps. With, with, with the enzymes that also are used in the cell to replicate, replicate the DNA. But then the you have an exponential phase and, and you will have the particular gene you're interested in looking at multiply many, many million times. Uh, this was how we used to do it. Uh, and then sequencing in the end of that gene mm -hmm. with amplify. But as I said, there's a really a um, molecular revolution going on these days and it's because of this new toolkit that, that's called high throughput sequencing. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail what it's about, but that means you have your PCR product or you, or you have your raw DNA extract. And instead of actually looking at one particular gene in here, you can take your entire DNA extract where, where the entire genome will be present of whatever animal you're looking at, or species you're looking at, you chop it onto the high throughput sequencer, and then you will have many, 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 many million of uh, DNA sequences out. And this can happen in, in, in only a few days. Uh, the level of information we can actually retrieve nowadays is, has increased manifold compared to how it just was uh, a few years back. Uh, one of the big bottlenecks nowadays is actually how to deal with all these data, because we need big servers, big computer, and a lot of very smart people to, to do the analysis there. So you cannot just sit with your own data on an Excel spreadsheet anymore and fiddle around. It's, it's really a little bit out of your own hands. So it takes big collaborations with a lot of people, and uh, it's, it's quite expensive. But then again, the end, we, we, have, we get so much more information from these, uh, these analysis than what we used to do. One of the problems when you, when you, when you do high throughput sequencing uh, is that it, we, we also call it, call it shotgun sequencing because you don't target a specific region, you just sequence whatever is in your DNA extract. It's not like a PCR reaction where you go for a specific gene. And that means there's a lot of, because when you have an ancient sample, only little of the DNA would be the true, authentic, endogenous DNA 
there will be a lot of uh, bacteria, there will be a lot of fungi, there will be a lot of uh, whatever is, is floating around the environment. And this is an example from a mammoth. We can see roughly 45% of this mammoth could be mapped onto the elephant genome, which means this, this is probably true mammoth DNA. But there's a lot of other stuff actually going on. Yeah. And I have to say, in an ancient DNA context, this is an extremely nice sample. A lot of the stuff I'm dealing with with humans, I'm below 1% of actually human DNA in the sample. Okay, then I thought I would, would outline, <coughs> give you an, an idea of what, what, what we're doing at Geogenetics and some of the studies that have been carried out in, in, in recent times. Uh, this is one of my, that was done by Tom, Tom Gilbert uh, a few years back, where um, they found these, these coprolites in, in some cave systems in, the, in, the, in Oregon, in the US, and um, the prof, but they were dated. They looked like human coprolites, but there was a lot of discussion going on. These coprolites were dated. The problem is they were, they were a thousand years older than what, it, what had been thought of was the first humans in the US. So these, these coprolites were too old to be human. Really. And there was a lot of resistance to this. Uh, a lot of people didn't believe in these results. Um, what could you do? OK, look at the coprolite. And of course, try and extract DNA from these things uh, and see what, what kind of DNA are we actually getting out. Is it a, is it a human or is it an animal? And in this case, uh, the DNA actually gave the answer and said these are indeed uh, human coprolites. And this pushed the, 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 the population of the Americas uh, a thousand years uh, back in time. Uh, I can't remember the exact dates now, but I think before this, it was believed about uh, 11,000 BP and now it pushed it back to 12,000 or something like that. Then there's this, this Sakak. Uh, <coughs> and this is, this is why I say that now the field of ancient DNA is really expanding into the genomic era where we have, where we, where we, where we, where we, we're looking at single genes, we're really trying to compile whole genomes, all three billion base pairs that are in the person in the human genome. And we couldn't, there's no way we could have done that without these new sequencing techniques. techniques. So this was the first ancient genomes ever be assembled. Uh, uh, a handful have followed since then, also of Neanderthals and then Denisovans and some other early humans. Um, but this uh, <coughs> this uh, showed several uh, several interesting things. It was the first uh, human genome, and it was based on hair that I found in Greenland from this from this guy up here. Um, and, and so now the hair seems it was extremely good. There's a very high endogenous human DNA constant they say, for a variety of reasons. Not because hair contains a lot of DNA as such, but it seems to it seems that hair is quite clean actually. Uh, and it's very it's very easy in the lab to clean the surface of hair and, and make sure that you only get the DNA that's present inside. That's why they had so much uh, huge success with these this hair sample. A couple of things were shown. Uh, for example, this is a, a, a PCA plot up here that, that is, we call it a genetic map of of the world, really, or at least of the, <coughs> the populations that decided to include in this map. And it just don't worry too much about the X in these things, but just an idea of, of genetic distances, really. Um, as you can see, the Sakak, which is a star up here, that's the, the ancient Greenlandic guy, he falls out close to Koryak and Chukic uh, in, the, in, the, in the Siberian population. So this shows, and very long, far away from Europeans or the, the other Americans, and also far away from the current uh, <coughs> Greenlandic populations, which, which is uh, up here and there. So this showed that this was a, actually a, an extinct Greenlandic population. They're not present there anymore. And it's a separate colonization event from the late, later uh, Inuits. And they, they, were, they made some calculation and could show that this migration probably happened from Saudi Arabia around five and a half thousand years ago. Then the <coughs> A complete Australian uh, Aboriginal genome was all, also assembled, and it was again from a hair sample, not, not quite as old. This, this hair was only <coughs> about 100, 150 years old. But it was important to go back and get a hair sample that was old to actually get an idea of the true history. And that's because Europeans arrived to Australia about 200 years ago or something. And then, uh, if you wanted a, a sample without genetic admixture in uh, genetic, uh, European genetic admixture, then you need to go back in time and actually get one of those. So I think this was picked up from a, from a museum in the UK. Um, again, whole genome was assembled. And this one, 
and it shows a couple of uh, quite interesting things. First of all, very significantly, this we were able to show based on quite fancy <laughs> analysis here that this was a whole separate migration, whole art, and uh, a newer, an older out of Africa migration event than, than what, what the rest of us come from. So it looks like there's been two major, uh, might have been more, but at least we were able to show in this study that these two major uh, migration events out of Africa with the Aboriginal uh, belonging to the oldest one happening roughly 65,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, going across Asia and ending up down in, in, in Australia around uh, 50,000 years ago. And then the second one that happened maybe 20,000 years, years later, which, which gave rise to all the Asian populations, European populations, and later the colonization of, of, the, of the Americans. Um, and I'm also able to show that the Aboriginals living in Australia today are direct descendants of this uh, very first uh, uh, migration event. And that is, of course, very important for these people to know that so their whole dream time, dream time authority in these things. So, so, so it was a very interesting results. A little bit Europe for a little while. Um, it's the classical hermitization question, whether, uh, whether there's been some big, uh, big uh, exchanges of the gene pools over time compared to, to, to um, yeah, from the ancient days to, to, to contemporary Europeans. And, uh, time to explain this. I don't know how much you can actually see here, but these networks you might have seen those. It's a very nice way of displaying genetic diversity in a population. So there are a couple of things you need to know. Each of these circles you see okay is one distinct genetic variation in the population. Um, so I don't know, there might be a hundred here or something, different genetic uh, genetic variations in, the, in this population. The size of each of these uh, correspond to how many individuals should, that share this particular haplotype. So of course the big one in the middle is a very common one, and all of these out here are only shared about maybe one or two individuals in this particular uh, assessment here. Yeah. Then you have the colors, which the black ones are the contemporary Swedes, and the red ones, if you can actually see those colors, then those are, those are 22 from, uh, from Hillenware culture individuals. Yeah. And what they were able to show here is that a quite a large fraction, again it's difficult for you to see, but quite a large fraction of these pitted wear culture individuals were not sharing the same haplotypes as, uh, as in the Swedes. You see there are, no, there are no red ones, for example, into the big common one in, in the middle. And some of, some of the smaller circles outside is, uh, is, is only red, meaning that these haplotypes are extinct today, but they are only shared by, by the, these ancient people. And then there were some, some uh, various variety of analysis done to show that this could not have happened by sheer chance. There must have been some sort of replacement of the gene pool going on uh, through time. Yeah, no genetic continuity. This is uh, related to the same question, uh, but based on much, much larger, fewer individuals with much larger, larger data. Uh, we have the generate a lot of data from three, again, Hitler culture individual, and then fund one TRP individual, uh, all living in the same area in Sweden. Um, and were able to show, you know, these were living at a contemporary, in, in a contemporary times, so they were quite genetically distinct with the, with the Neolithic farmer falling out down near the, the South European people, whereas uh, the hunter-gatherers uh, falling out, it doesn't, doesn't show that well on this part, but more, looking more like the modern day Baltic regions. And so quite distinct. Uh, yeah, Peter Ware resembles modern day Balsy, and CB resembles modern day Southern Europe. And again, this was this was based on a lot more data. This was genome wide data, so hundreds of thousands of uh, genome of DNA sequences. Uh, and it sort of suggests because uh, that, 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 that farming was probably accompanied by, by, by yeah, the spread of agriculture were accompanied by some genetic influx from, from southern Europe. That's at least the conclusion that were, that were made in this paper. Again, it's based on very few individuals, and there's a lot more work to be done here to actually assess this in greater detail. Uh, but, but it's at least an indication that something interesting going on. Okay, towards the very end, let me just uh, show you a few slides from the project I'm, I'm currently employed on. It's, it's, still, it's still very much in its, from the DNA side of things, it's still very much in the, in the initial phases. Uh, and that's uh, the RISE, the ERC funded project that Christian Christensen is, Christian Christensen is, a, is a PI on. Uh, and he'll shoot that. So the, 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 the project has uh, four main, main phases, I'm sure you 
might have heard of this already in question, we'll talk more about it, but I'm mainly uh, dealing with the first uh, point up here, which is dealing with human mobility and, and, the, and the ancient DNA analysis of that. And uh, the idea is really to, to look at all these different uh, Bronze Age societies and look at genetic structure. Are they are they genetically different from each other? What kind of mobility was going on? Are they what are perhaps is, hopefully you'll be able to estimate some of the population sizes here and the genetic origin? How origin? How much do they also resemble the, the modern day European populations? That's sort of the framework we want to try and analyze these things. Um, and how do we do that? We've been collecting a lot of samples recently from a variety of places, over 300 samples, and uh, they've all been extracted and, and have been, a lot of them have been analyzed at the moment. Mainly teeth. The good thing about taking teeth is that we, the teeth, if you, can get a, if you can get an intact teeth, the chance of actually having contamination inside of the teeth is, is quite slim, whereas where you with bones, it's a bit different. It's a bit different than the times over the years. So, so at, least, at least we hope that by taking teeth, cutting it off, and, and drilling up the dentine that will have a, a cleaner substrate. And the idea is, by using this many samples, doing a little bit the same as you saw in the Swedish study before, we want to map all these individuals out, out in, a, in a genetic map of, of a framework of present-day European population and see how does all these different cultures and these samples from different areas map onto the, 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 the genetic picture of Europe today and see which one look alike, which one look far, far from each other. Uh, and really get a high resolution image of, uh, of the population at these times. Um, in addition, we really hope, and I'm screening for that at the moment, screening through potential candidates, we really hope to find a couple of individuals in here that have exceptional DNA preservation so we can do a uh, uh, map out the whole genome of these. And then in much greater detail, I says these questions to solve their origin or the SACAC that, that address the timing of the migration and the, the genetic mixture in, in, in much greater detail. Very preliminary results. It's uh, yeah, as I said, we have DNA extracts from more than 300 individuals now sitting in the freezer, and uh, and we can actually amp amplify short fragments of mitochondrial DNA. Normally, in ancient DNA research, mitochondrial DNA is the stuff we target first because we have hundreds of thousands of mitochondrial DNA <coughs> so our cells, meaning that we also have a lot more mitochondrial DNA present. Uh, so at least a good indication that, that there is uh, there is a D DNA in a, in a lot of, a lot of the cells. And then, what is happening right here before Christmas, I will submit at least 40, uh, 40 individuals uh, spread across the, the entire region, or the entire Europe, as, as you saw with these different countries and different cultures, um, for high throughput sequencing and generate many millions of reads, hopefully from, from, uh, from uh, reads from all the individuals. And I have to say, the libraries look very, very nice. There are very, various ways of assessing those. At least, so it looks like there is actually uh, a lot of DNA in, the, in, the, in our samples at, at present. One thing is having a really good library, but as you show from this shotgun sequencing approach, is you don't actually always know what you're looking at before you have it sequenced. So the thing is that you have DNA in your sample it doesn't really imply that you have a lot of human DNA. It could also be bacteria. I don't actually, you don't actually know before you have this, the sequence as well. But that is uh, going to be very exciting. <coughs> so the next one to two months from a DNA perspective of this project will actually be very, very crucial and really, really help us uh, uh, work out exactly what questions we can we can we can frame frame up and what we can uh, how much we can we can save with these things and hopefully hopefully also help us identify a couple of individuals uh, that we can map out the whole genome. Few words on the hair because uh, I work with the hair. We we have good success with hair and genetics, but I say that's uh, I haven't had very good success with hair. I, I we sampled the April girl and the four men. Would so you I, mind turn towards us, please, when you talk? No, no. Okay. You better. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I haven't had good, good success with the hair samples from from, from genetics so far. The Equipil, for example, or the Um have been, have been quite problematic, I have to say. Very low uh, DNA content in those. And, uh, and that's uh, why that is, we don't know. But the thing is, people in ancient DNA research have had good success with hair previously. They've, um, but it's been from Mammoth, it's been from the Greenlandic guy. These are both preserved in permafrost environment. And then it's been from, uh, and then it's been from the Aboriginal that was only 100, 100 years old or something. This is from a temperate environment in these oak coffins, probably low pH and all these things, which is not very good for, for DNA, uh, DNA preservation. Uh, so that could be why. 
Uh, hopefully in the teeth, we, 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 we still have high hopes for those. This is the rice. If you should be interested in more than that, you can, you can look at the webpage or talk to Preston. And that was it. Thank you. <laughs>